Good morning. And how is everybody today? It's a beautiful day. If you could sign the attendance pads and pass those down, that would be so helpful. I always appreciate all of those who do sign. Um, today is the Satellite High School Baccalaureate program. It's going to be here in the sanctuary at 3 p.m. I want to thank all of those who brought in cookies, brownies, and other little snacky food. That was so wonderful, and thank you of that. If you'd like to come, just sit in on the baccalaureate. I think there's space um, to be uh, just to hear it. I'm going to be the keynote speaker, so it'll so it'll be interesting. <clears throat> Also, the handyman ministry, we have a, as you know, we do have a handyman ministry, and we're seeking to have other people who want to help out on that. And you don't have to be someone who says, I can only, you know, do during the day. If you can get one weekend a month or sometime in the evening, it would be very helpful. And the tasks are whatever you're capable of doing. A lot of them are yard work and light, car, light handyman stuff changing light bulbs that people can't get up there and reach anymore and things like that. But it's a real service we do not only to the members of the church, but to those in the community. And if you feel like that's something you could do, just call the office because we need to, uh, we, we've got actually more calls than we can get out to. So if you'd like more information on that, just say you want someone to call you, just call the office and someone will call you back. Uh, the giving statements for the first quarter in the back there, if you, could, if you haven't picked them up, please pick them up because we're going to mail them this week. Um, it's every two we pick up saves about a dollar in the church postage so that's why we're doing that um, and this Friday I had a grandson born Aww. I got a video see if can we get the video going He was born on May the 4th, so that's the Star Wars Day, for those who don't realize that. May the 4th be with you. And what was truly amazing is his reveal was a lightsaber. They, his, little, his older brother was able to turn on the lightsaber to see what color it was, so we just keep the Star Wars theme going. So it's exciting. We were there on Friday, we were there Saturday, and so... Um, but everybody's doing okay. Um, they, they came a little early. My daughter-in-law is still having a little, she was developing preeclampsia, which is not very good. And she's doing better since they got it off, but her blood work has not come back to normal yet. So they're going to keep her one more night tonight. They were going to release her today, but, and I hope all that's going well. So if you could just, that's the one prayer that you could pray that um, that goes well. And we're trying to make sure we have all of our graduates Count for this is my first year here, and so I don't know everybody yet. I think we got Nick is graduating. Yay, Nick. Yay, Nick. So on the 20th, we're going to honor those. And if there's anybody else that I'm missing, please let me know. We have Taliesin, who's um, Christopher Powers' daughter, the first service. So, and uh, got one other one someone has given me. So if you, if you know someone in the church that's graduating, because we want to honor them on the 20th. Well, with that, then let us stand and greet one another with the peace of God.
Well, this time, let us return to our seats as we prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. this time, let us stand for our call to worship. Sing to, sing to the Lord a new song. Oh. The Lord has done marvelous things. Let all creation praise the Lord and break forth into joyous singing. Would you join us for the first hymn of the morning? Number 139, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. There will be a little inter interlude between the first and the third, first and second verses. So just stay with me.
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Number 395, take time to be holy, all three verses.
At this time, we invite our children to head off to Children's Church. And during the offering, Marilyn's going to be playing the bells and as we get ready to receive our offering. And so she's trying to find out if there are people interested in wanting to be in a bell choir. And they wouldn't be practicing all year long. What it would be is like leading up to Christmas, about six, eight weeks beforehand, there's a lot of good Christmas music would form the choir, they would play and then break for a while and then form again, maybe for Easter and then maybe some other time to play some, because there's a lot of good music out there. Y'all own the $16,000 worth of bells, but they're just sitting in a closet. There's a few things we would have to buy if we wanted to bring them back up like pads and stuff. And so before we spend the money, we just wanted to see if there was interest in that. So, so that's one of the ways that we can offer our talents to God is through service. So those who are somewhat musically inclined and can count, because that's the biggest thing in, um, in bell playing is can you count? So, because the counting gets tricky. Of, well, it's my turn to play. Yeah, so. But that's, there's just lots of ways that we give our gifts and our blessings back to God. And so as we go to prepare for our tithes and offerings, let us pray. O oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for so many blessings. We thank you for the gifts you give us, the talents you give us, and the abilities that we can interact in this world. And Lord, we thank you for all these blessings you give us. And Lord, now as we return a portion of that blessing back to you, Please, Lord, bless these, our tithes and offerings. Guide this church in their use, and Lord, multiply them for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. We now come to that time where we lift up our prayer request. And I think I saw that Ed Eliason pop in. There he is. 
good to see you and we continue to pray for you and we will be praying for you this morning but we're praising god you're here today and it's a good thing and we need to continue to lift up cody cody's still having some health issues and solicit your prayers and as always we I invite you to come to the lord as we go to the come to the altar as we go to the lord in prayer so anybody who would like to come with prayer requests that they have on their heart or just to be part of this prayer i invite you now to come and let us go to the lord in prayer Well, gracious Heavenly Father, as we come here this morning, we come here with thankful hearts, thankful that you are our God, thankful that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to take our place on the cross, to die our death, to take all of our sins upon himself. Lord, we are so humbled by that great act of love. And we come here this morning thanking you and praising your name for it thanking you that you give us victory in this life, that as we come to you and surrender our will to you, you free us for joy and hope and love. And we thank you, Lord, that you give us this, these blessings. And gracious Heavenly Father, as we come here this day, we, we remember those that are hurting, that are needing your healing. And so, Lord, this day we do lift up Ed Eliason to you and Cody to you and Isabel to you, and Sharon, and all of those that are on our prayer list, Lord, be with these. You know the needs in all of them. You know the healing that needs to take place, Lord. And you know the strength they need, and the peace they need. Lord, we just know they need you. So be with each one, and touch them as only you can. And Lord, we also lift up to you that one name, that one request that is still silent in our heart that we name before you now. And Lord, we lift up our country to you. We remember all of those that were praying this week during National Day of Prayer throughout this country. And Lord, we continue to pray for our country and our leaders. And so Lord, if we be with all of those who have been elected and all those appointed at our national, state, and local level. Lord, be with them and guide them. Lead good counsel to them. Open their eyes and ears to your ways. Because Lord, we can get caught up in our own way thinking we know it all. When none of us knows it all, we need you, and especially our leaders, Lord, so be with them, so that the laws they pass are good, and, it, and peace and goodness may come our way. And Lord, for all those that are preparing to graduate, and those college kids that have, that have graduated and finished their semester, Lord, be with them. And as they transition, Lord, into a new phase of their life, give them a sense of purpose and hope as they dream their dreams and they fulfill those dreams. And Lord, to those that are still in school and, and finishing their, their finals and terms here, be with them, Lord. Help them to grow and to become the young men and women you've created them to be. And Lord, for all of those who teach and work in our schools, Lord, be with them. For the lives they touch are our future. And so be with them, Lord, as, they, as these young men and women just figure out what they've been called to be as they grow up. And Lord, we lift up all of those in our hospital this day or nursing homes, or nursing care facilities. And Lord, we ask that you be with them and strengthen them. And be with the doctors and nurses and so many who work in these places. And give them patience and understanding and wisdom as they treat them so that they can be a part of the healing process. But Lord, we know that you are the one who heals. So be with all of those that are sick this day. And once again, Lord, we do thank you for Jesus Christ who died our death, who rose again to offer us eternal life, and who taught us to pray the prayer we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
The choir will sing a piece this morning by Johann Sebastian Bach, German composer, 1685 to 1750. He was regarded as perhaps the greatest composer of all time. His works were revered for the musical complexities and stylistic innovations. The piece we sing today is adapted from Psalm 98, in case you would like to follow along in your Bible. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from 1 John, the fifth chapter, beginning in the first verse. Hear now these words. 
Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. For whoever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. There are three that justify. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, last weekend I got to do a wedding, as you know, and one of the fun things about wedding is when there's little kids involved, is flower girls and ring bearers, is how are they going to act on the day? And as, as the ring bearer of this one, he did a great job. And as I was watching him practice and then come down the aisle, I was reminded of this story about another young ring bearer. But the rehearsal, this five-year-old was obviously worried about messing up. And he was getting nervous because there were so many people there. It was a big wedding. And his grandmother was noticing how flustered he was getting. So she went over to him because she knew her little grandson was also very competitive. And she says, you know what? I think I'm going to give a prize to the person who does the best job tomorrow. Well, he heard this challenge and his chin up. He looked at the 14 other people who were in the wedding party, not counting the minister. He looked all around and he whispered to himself, I think I can do it. <laughs> well, the next day, the church was filled. The organ was sounding triumphantly and it came time for the little boy to walk to the front and his head was held high and he did a beautiful job. And at the reception, his grandmother told him that he had won the prize. And he was both excited and relieved. And he said, he said to her, I was pretty sure I had it. That is, until Uncle Aunt, and that is until Aunt Dana came in wearing that white dress and the horn was blowing. Then I started thinking she might win. <laughs> but being victorious, isn't that a great feeling? When it goes your way, just like when it doesn't go your way, it kind of depresses you. When I pastored in Gainesville, and it was football weekend, and if the Gators lost, attendance would be down. It just kind of like they couldn't worship if they lost. But if they won, worship was even more vibrant and things like that. And I would remind them it's not supposed to be that way. But that's what victory does to it. We love being victorious. And as John nears the end of this letter, and he's talking about what this victory we have, there's two ideas that are in the back of John's mind throughout this entire letter. And those two things are is that the love of God and the love of people are inseparable. This is why when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He couldn't give one. He gave two. He said, love of God and love of neighbor. Everything hinges on those two commandments. And as we heard this morning, John talks about our relationship with God as being a new birth. And he puts it in an interesting way. He says, we, when we believe in God, we get a new birth and then we get a new family. And this is our new family, the other people in church. And that we're to love the children of God. We're to love one another. And so being born into this family of God, we're born into this innate longing to love one another. Because God knows if congregations are going to be together, if the body of Christ is going to thrive, it needs to love one another. And we have this longing when we come to Christ to love and to be loved. And unfortunately, the world wants to strip that love out of us. It wants to take that longing out of us. We live in a world anymore that wants to pit father against son, brother against brother, mother against daughter, daughter against daughter, and friend against friend. The world wants to tear the family apart, both the normal family and the spiritual family. And for young people today, we live in times that are tough for them because they're all on some sort of social network and they're all being blasted 
constantly by feeling. People are either telling them they're doing good or telling them you're nothing. I can only imagine what bullying is like in this day and age. I mean, when I was growing up, the bully had to be there to do it. Now the bully doesn't have to be there. And this is a terrible thing, and, and it leads us to do terrible things and to make terrible choices. And if, and if bullying isn't bad enough, there's so many opportunities for us to get into trouble today. When my mom was growing up, she said, yeah, when the revival came to town, you went to it because that was the only entertainment in town. You didn't go there necessarily to hear the preacher. You went to see what people were wearing because that was the entertainment. Today, there are so many choices that will get us into trouble. And this idea of us turning away from God into the world really isn't anything new. It's been going on along, and there's, and there's different people who've, who put it in good perspective. Some of y'all baseball people may know who Earl, Earl Horsizer was. He was one of the great baseball players for the Dodgers. And for two months in 1988, he was pitching lights out. He was only allowing .6 runs a game at the end of the season all the way up to the World Series and the World Series. I mean, and hit, at the World Series, he was giving God all the credit. But he says it wasn't always so, and he hadn't been a Christian for all that long. He says there was a time when I was in the minor leagues just a few years earlier, and he says I had a .6 ERA then too. I was only allowing .6 runs, and then I started reading the newspaper, and I started reading the Dodgers were calling, listening to that, and listening to all the hype. And I started going with my friends. I stopped listening to God. And I started to go out with the guys and not really have a focus on what I was supposed to be doing. And he says, by the time I went out partying like crazy and forgot about God, my ERA went up to allowing 8.6 runs a game. He says, it was like God had come down from heaven and hit me over the head and said, you dummy, remember who got you here. Remember where your abilities came from. And then there was Michelle Akers, who by college had become an all-star, an all-American soccer star. She earned ESPN's Woman Athlete of the Year in 1985. And that same year, the United States formed its first women's national team, soccer team, with Michelle as a starter. And in 1991, the U.S. team won the first ever Women's World Cup, and Michelle scored 10, in the five, 10 goals in five games, including the championship's winner. And she signed an endorsement deal and became the first woman soccer player to have a paid sponsor. She played professionally in Sweden. Michelle's drive and tenacity were beginning to pay off for her. And she even tried out as a place kicker for the Dallas Cowboys. She was able to kick a 52-yard field goal in practice with them. But just as her star was rising, Michelle's health suddenly turned against her. By 1993, the woman who used grit and determination to make life happen found her life unmanageable. She said at this time, she said, each day I felt like I had flown to Europe with no food or sleep, then flown right back and trained for hours. She was diagnosed with chronic fatigue and immune dysfunction system. It's a debilitating disease affecting more than a million Americans. And she said, when it was really bad, I couldn't sit in a chair. The racking migraine stranded me at home, unable to even brush my teeth or eat. And she said, for the first time, I could no longer count on my old friend's strength and hard work to get me through. She said, I had no way to cope. She said, I couldn't bear not to be the best in the world, not to be the one who could bounce back from any injury. It was the only me I knew. And then her marriage began to fail, and after four years, it broke up in 1994 as Michelle reached that lowest point in her life. She said, I was so sick, I couldn't take a five minute walk without needing two days in the couch to recover. I was forced to spend a lot of time thinking about who I was and I didn't like what I saw. And then she remembered, she said, I put trust in Jesus Christ as a high school student. She said, but when I got into college and after that I ignored him, I said, God, I got this. I know what I'm doing. I don't need your help now. And she said, you know, but now I'm sick and alone. And she accepted finally an invitation by her strength coach to go tend to service in Northwood Community Church in Longwood, Florida. And although she couldn't articulate a time in retrospect, she said, I needed to get things right with God. 
She said, looking back, I think I was, I think God was gently, patiently tapping me on the shoulder, calling my name for years. But continually, I brushed him off saying, hey, I know what I'm doing. I can make these decisions, leave me alone. Then I think he finally said, okay, I'm, I'll cross my arms and just leave you alone, knowing that I was going to spiral downward. It took total devastation before I could acquiesce and say, okay, God, you have my life. Please help me. Both of these people and many others who have come to know Christ but then turned back away from him are struggling today to know what it means to walk in Christ's way. And there are millions of others who haven't even accepted Christ for the first time. And there are others today who think or fooling themselves, yeah, I'm walking with Christ, but I don't have that peace because we're missing something. We're missing what it means to find victory in life through obedience to Christ in his way. I believe this is why John writes to the churches. This is love for God to obey his commands and his commands are not burdensome for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the son of God. And in this passage this morning, we see this neat circular spiral again. To love God is to love his family. To love his family is to obey his commandments. And to obey God's commandments is to love God. You're back there at the beginning. And as you do that circle, you begin to spiral upward. You find that victory. And that's why it's so important that we focus on being obedient to God, not obedient to ourselves. Because we can fool ourselves thinking we're being obedient to ourselves, and that is being obedient to God. We lose focus. There was a speaker one time who was trying to motivate a group of people. Now, these were 20 and 30 year olds when he said this. I think if he said it to our group, he wouldn't say it the same way. He said, if I put a two by four down and run it across the front here, he said, all of y'all could walk across it. Now, I'm not sure if all of us could walk across a two by four on there, but we'd give it a good try. But 20 year olds, they could probably walk across that two by four. But he said, if I suspend this thing 20 stories up in the air and ask you to walk across it between two buildings, only a handful of you would probably make it because you would stop focusing on walking and you would start focusing on failing. And that's what we do in life. We stop focusing on the obedience to God and we start focusing on other things and we fail. We need to know what it means to be obedient to God. We get in trouble because we focus on the wrong thing. I think this is why Paul in his letter to the Philippians put it this way. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Our faith is seen in action, not in just belief. Belief will only get you too far. I love what James says about, oh, I believe in God. He says in his, his letter, you believe in God, yippee. Even the demons believe that. That might not be quite the literal translation. <laughs> but he kind of says, instead of yippee, well, good. Even the demons believe in that being a little sarcastic there. It's not enough just to believe. James would go on and to say, if, if there are not actions to pack, back up our belief, then our faith is no good. Coming on Sunday morning and singing is wonderful. Greeting one another is wonderful. Having a great morning here is wonderful. But if we're not obedient Monday through Saturday, then it's all for nothing. It was just a feel good for today. And I don't want you to have just a feel good for today. I want you to be victorious in Christ. Victory comes when we walk in God's way and allow God to use us. And to use that, we have to look at how we relate to God. I love what Corey Ten Boom shared one time. She was, after she, the World War II, she went around speaking all over the place and she held up a glove one time. And she said, this glove can't do a thing. I could tell this glove, pick up this cross and this glove couldn't do it. Now, if I put my hand in that glove, I can say to that glove, pick up this thing and it will do it. This glove will do whatever I want it to do because I am now in the glove. 
And he says, that's the way we need to see ourselves in God. We are gloves. And we can only do things when God is in us and guiding us and completely in us, in all the fingers. Another way of saying that is that we have to surrender our will to God for all of us to be used, not just a little bit. We have to surrender everything. And I think one of the great tragedies in walking with Christ is that we convince ourselves we are being 100% obedient. And nobody can be 100% obedient. We always have something we can grow on. We always have some place to grow in and learn from. During on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus put it this way, if we think we've gotten it, we're all right. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And then Jesus, right after that teaching, gave the illustration of the house being built on rock. That when we become obedient to God, we're like those who build their house on rock and not on sand. That when the storms come, it can survive those storms. And it's through obedience. That is the victory we have on earth and the victory that leads us to everlasting life. And it begins with a simple yes to Christ, that you are my Lord. But if we're going to make Christ our Lord, then we've got to make him our Lord. What Lord means he has say over our lives. If he doesn't have say over our lives, then he's not Lord. It's as simple as that. Do we allow Christ to be our Lord? And do we subject our will to his will and follow his ways? Someone summed it up this way. He says, we're not called to Christian work. That's where we fool ourselves. I'm working for the church. I don't have time for God because I'm working for the church. Our call is to the will of God and to be and do whatever he requires of us. Obedience must be the struggle and desire in our life. Obedience, not hard and forced. We're not doing obedience to earn God's love. We already have God's love. We're being obedient because of God's love. That obedience, that ready, loving, and spontaneous, that doing of duty, not merely that duty may be done, but that the soul in doing it may become capable of receiving and uttering God. That's why we're obedient to God's will. To be victorious in this life. Because his ways lead to victory. Our ways kind of mess it up. Give your will to God. Find where he's calling you to be. You're never too old to find a place because you're never too old for God. And God always has something for you to do. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all the blessings in this life. We thank you for your love, your grace, and your peace. Most especially, Lord, we thank you that we're always in your will when we work in your ways because there isn't a person who's out of your will. There isn't a person who isn't called to do something, a person who isn't called to you. Lord, help each one here to know the will of God for their life so that they may lead victorious lives, that they may shine their light into this world. Lord, be with us. Send your Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us, because we can't do it without it. We pray this in your Son's most precious holy name. Amen. And one of the ways that we do remember God's love for us is through receiving Holy Communion. How we remember on that final night that Jesus gathered his disciples together, and he taught with them, and he ate with them. And Scripture records, he even sang with them that night. It's the only time in Scripture that recorded that Jesus sang. But Jesus did sing, and it was that night. And after he'd done all these things, he did one final thing with them. He took ordinary bread, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, all of you, for this is my body which has been given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks over the cup and he gave it to them and said, Drink from you all of this, for this is the blood of the new covenant, which has been poured out for you and for many. 
Do this in remembrance of me. And so when we come to the table, we remember Christ's love for us. We remember his sacrifice for us. And we remember that he's going to come again for us. Christ loves us, so we remember these things. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to this table, we struggle at times because we're not 100% obedient. We try, Lord, we try, we try, we try, and then we mess up. We end up doing that thing you didn't want us to do or we didn't do the thing you called us to do. And so, Lord, how can we come to your table knowing that we have messed up? But, Lord, we come knowing that you are a forgiving God, that when we fail, you get down on your knees and you pick us up, you brush us off, you give us instruction, and you send out in a loving way and telling us to do it again. And so, Lord, let each one hear, hear these words. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Lord, let us know that we live lives as forgiven people, and because we're forgiven, we can be obedient. And so, Lord, as we come to this, your table, may this bread and this juice be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be one with you and one with each other in ministry until we feast together at that heavenly banquet. That's in your Son's most precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, if those who are serving communion could come forward and our musicians. Just a reminder that we're serving communion by intention, which means take the bread and dip it into there. As you come down either aisle, um, there's hand washing stations there, and you can come, and after you receive, you can kneel at the altar. Come as the row in front of you comes. Come, the table is open, and all are welcome to come.
Let us pray. Oh God of grace and peace, we thank you that you meet us at the table. We thank you that you fill us with your spirit, that you encourage us every day, and that as we become more obedient to you, we discover a deeper love of you. So Lord, help us to discover this deeper love in the obedience we have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please join us for the final hymn as we stand, number 370, Victory in Jesus. As we prepare to leave, let us reach across and grab one another's hands. And as you go, may you find victory in Christ. May you find victory in obedience. And in being obedient, may you find the love of God, the love of God if you've never experienced it before. So go in that powerful love. Go in that powerful will of God and praise Him. Amen. Amen. Amen.